All right, we're in our final part of this series called Killer Sermon. And if this is your first time today, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. We've been in Matthew 5 and Matthew 6, and now we're in Matthew 7. And it has not been pretty. I mean, everything from amputation of body parts uh, to trying your best to be perfect to getting right before you offer your animal sacrifice. Lots and lots of deadly teachings of Jesus. Nobody escapes alive. And that's the whole point. As we finish out this sermon today, I want us to just take a brief look at where we've been the last few weeks together. I don't want anybody to lose sight of what we've seen. We saw that the true standard of the law, well, it's all or nothing. And there is no middle ground. There is no room for cherry picking. There is no way you're going to pick this but not this and this but not this. No, he says we have to compete and win against the Pharisees. We have to surpass their righteousness. It has to be perfection like God is perfect. And so that's what we are looking at with this all or nothing proposition. Next, we see that anger equals murder. Anybody here ever been angry at somebody? Well, according to Jesus in these teachings, it's the same as murder. Looking with lust. Now, I'm not talking about anybody in this room, of course. But, you know, non-church people, right? Out there when they look with lust... It's the same as adultery. Divorce, without a a, a correct reason, it becomes adultery. And calling someone a fool, well, you're in danger of the fires of hell. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Not a sweet passage for Christian growth, but nails in the coffin of anybody who thinks they can do it. He goes on, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, or be thrown into hell. Hell is threatened three times. Next, he says, Let others take advantage of you. Give to whomever asks of you. Let anyone borrow money from you without a credit report. Just give it to them. Fork over the cash, man. Also, love your enemies. You know, lay awake nights and pray for them. I'm sure we're all doing this, right? We have a long list of our enemies and we're praying for them as you go through your quiet time at night. Of course, most of you, your quiet time is around 3.30 a.m. I know you're getting up and getting fresh for your day, right? You see, he's got a standard here. Love those who hate you. Be perfect like God is perfect. We're not done Don't practice your righteousness before men. Don't sound a trumpet when you give to the poor. Don't pray on the street corners to be seen by others. Don't pray meaningless repetitions. If you forgive others, God will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. Ouch. That's going to leave a mark. Don't judge lest you too be judged. And as we finished out, Jesus ultimately said, you're hypocrites. So who's he talking to? Well, what we see here is the true context of Jesus' words. He's saying, get right, answerable to the Sanhedrin. Who is his audience? It's a Jewish audience full of hypocrisy. And if we take this passage before the cross and pull it up out of its context and bring it into today and dance around the planet acting as if we have a shot at it, then we have missed the meaning of Jesus Christ. We don't want to miss the meaning. The proud person looks at this and says, I can do it. I'll give it my best shot. And God, you watch my smoke. And we set out to please. The person who has been captivated by the grace of God and knows that all standards have been met in Jesus. The person who knows that everything must be gifted to us looks at this and says humbly, Lord, no way. No way. 
And so we see the true standard of humility that we encountered last week. Don't fast to be noticed. Again, fasting, largely a Jewish tradition. Be heavenly minded, not earthy minded. And they didn't have a clue how to be heavenly minded. Do you know why? Because they were not raised and seated in heavenly places. They were unregenerate Jews before the cross, before the indwelling of Christ, before Pentecost. They had no clue about heavenly mindedness. Don't worry about food or drink or clothing. Are you kidding me? Jesus, that's all we worry about all day long. And so this standard of of trust and this standard of humility and this standard of obedience, there's no way they could attain to it. And that is precisely what the Son of God wants them to see. And so, behold, the two messages of Jesus... Burying people under the true standard of the law and then prophesying about a new way to come. Now, I want you to watch the brilliance of our Savior as we continue, as we finish out this sermon this morning. Where would you go? Understanding what you know about the gospel, where would you go next? Having led them into death, where would you go next? Having shown them they have no hope under Moses. Having shown them that they are spiritually dead at their core. And they can never achieve humility. And they can never achieve obedience in the current state that they're in. Where would you go next? Of course, any good gospel preacher would go to an invitation to life. And that is exactly where we will see the Son of God go this morning. So watch as Jesus ropes them in, showing them their death, and then speaks of a new way. It's not here yet. It hasn't come. It hasn't arrived. But he's alluding to it. He's talking about it. And yet they won't understand. They won't understand until they are indwelt with his life. Here he talks about gospel preaching In the future, when they take hold of this message, he says, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So, who are these dogs? It reminds me of Paul. Paul called certain people dogs. They were those who had heard the message and rejected it. They had heard the message and said, no, thank you. They had heard about the grace of God and then opted for Moses instead. And so he called them dogs. And what about swine? There's another passage in the New Testament where we're told that a dog returns to its own vomit. And a swine or a a pig returns to wallowing in the mud. If that's who it is by nature. And so many flirt with the gospel and yet return to a life of sin. Many are are hearing the message and yet they're not born again. And they go back to what they know. The one and only way that they think they can get life. And so what he's saying here is if you've preached to somebody and you find out they're a dog, move on. If you find out they're a pig, move on. You might oink at them, but don't preach at them. You're done with them. Dust your feet and move along. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. I want you to notice this sort of future language. It will be opened. You will find. They need to start seeking. It's not time to find yet, but they need to start seeking. It's not time to open the door yet. The invitation is not quite there, but Jesus is giving them clues. It's an appetizer For the meal that is upcoming. And so he's led them to see their death. 
And now he's talking about a father who will freely give and be a good giver and a giver of good things so that we don't regret the relationship. There's trust. We can trust his goodness. But remember where we are. We're before the cross. Jesus has not hung on that cross at Calvary yet. There is no resurrection. There is no Pentecost. There is no indwelling. So Jesus is describing the new way, but it's not here yet. Or what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? You see what Jesus is doing? He's beginning to build trust. He's saying you can trust daddy father. When he becomes your daddy father spiritually, when you are born of him, you can trust him. But you know, how many of us think we've gotten a stone from God instead of bread? How many of us think that we've been fed, uh, given a snake instead of fish? You know, when we look at this message, many Christians have trusted Christ for, for heaven, for a destination, for a future someday. But right now, they feel like they're stuck with a stone. They're trying to eat a rock. And Jesus wants us to know that there's a true meal in the gospel. The forgiveness message is no stone. It's truly the bread of life. The resurrection message is no stone. It is truly a message of life. But when we water things down... We miss it, and we trade bread for a stone. We imagine our Father to be a giver of average things. We look at the gospel as good news instead of great news. We look at the gospel as a mediocre message instead of a message that rocked the early church such that people were willing to be tortured and killed and dragged from their homes for something that was not just a promise of a future place to hang out. No, they believed that inside of them they possessed the resurrection life of Jesus Christ and that was a big deal. And it's a big deal today. And the forgiveness we have is off the charts controversial. If you have not encountered controversy about the forgiveness that you believe in, you don't know the forgiveness that you live in. The forgiveness we have is controversial. Who is this God that would forgive our future sins? That would not wait for us to visit a confession booth? That would not wait for us to apologize for each one? Who is this God that would give us this quality of a gospel? This is off the charts. This is off the chain. <laughs> Can I say that in church? This gospel is so good, so rich, so deep, so meaningful. And yet, many of us settle for less. We settle for a life of feeling beat up by God, beat up by religion, beat up by church. We settle for something lesser because we don't bring ourselves to believe that God is this good. But He is this good. He treats you as if you've never sinned a day in your life. I want you to imagine just for a minute that you have never committed a single sin in your life. Just imagine that. Soak that in for a second. He treats you better than that. You are not innocent. You are righteous. You are treated exactly like Jesus Christ is treated. As He is, so also are we in this world, the Bible says. This gospel is incredible. The only limit to it is the degree to which we will take it in and recognize it, believe it, and count on it. The gospel is as good as it gets. Will you settle for a stone when God has given us the bread of life? Don't settle. Don't settle for anything less. As a young person, I wanted intimacy with God. I laid in bed at night, and I would beg him to come close to me, to come near to me. I would beg for forgiveness. I would beg for closeness. And by day, I would work all day long, literally, 
subway car to subway car, house to house, trying to get right and stay right with God. What did I need? I needed to know that he gave me bread, bread to eat, the bread of life, not a stone. I was believing in a message of stones, a rocky message, a message that you couldn't grow in. It was very much rocky soil, if you will. We need to know the closeness is free. The intimacy is an absolute gift. The oneness with Jesus, we have it. I'm not talking about waiting for a free gift. I'm talking about looking into the gift you already have. If you have received Christ, you are as close to Jesus today as you will ever be. And that includes heaven. I recognize we will get a resurrection body. We'll have resurrection eyes to see the Father face to face. But your union with Jesus will not get more unionized. You will not be more united to Jesus Christ than you are right now. Anyone who has joined himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. And that's true right now. There is so much to understand. There's so much to celebrate. There's so much to learn. There's so much to grow in. But we are not inching toward closeness with God, we are learning about the closeness that we already have. The message today that we hear all over the place is feeble and weak. It is so pathetic that we will receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And then we will believe that we are inching closer through quiet times. The phrase quiet time appears zero times in the Bible. As I say, go ahead and have a loud time. (laughs) We're inching closer as we do this group and this volunteer work and this church attendance and this Bible study and this prayer time. And we believe that we're getting closer. That's pitiful. That is pitiful and sad compared to the truth. The truth is powerful. The truth is perfect union with Jesus Christ in every moment. Oh, this is a platitude. I don't understand it. This sounds good in church for an hour. Now, you're talking about your emotions. I have them too. Everybody in this room has them. So what? We feel. We feel all kinds of things. You feel close. You feel distant. You feel clean. You feel dirty. We all do. Did Jesus promise us that we'd feel something? Or did He promise us that He's done something? He will never leave us, never forsake us. We are united to Christ in His death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. We are one with Him forever. That's a reality. It's a fact, not a feeling. Feelings are great. Let's talk about them. Let's not belittle them. Let's express them. God, I feel totally distant from You. Now, Father, what's the truth? Teach me. Show me. It's okay to feel, but we don't camp there. It's okay to feel, but it's the truth that sets us free. If you then, being evil, wait a minute, we're not evil. Oh, he's talking to... If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father... You can't say that, Jesus. That's sacrilegious. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? They don't know how to relate to Jesus' Father. They're still evil. Do you see it? It's a sermon of transition. Present the law. Present their death. And then invite them to a new way that's almost here. But right now in this moment, they're still evil. Are you evil? You are not evil. Though we were slaves of sin, we became obedient from the heart. We were enemies of God, but we were washed. We were justified. We were sanctified. We were set apart. That's who we were, but now we are. Here... We're listening in. We're eavesdropping. 
The book of Matthew enables us to eavesdrop on a conversation that Jesus is having with unregenerate Jews before the cross. What a shame and what a direct play into the hand of the enemy when we take this out of context, hoist it up over here, and teach it as New Testament teaching for believers, calling them evil. Can you imagine what our Father thinks of that? Having made us the righteousness of God, having made us fully forgiven, united with Jesus, and called us the righteousness of God. Can you imagine what the Father thinks when He hears preaching all over the planet that says we're evil and we've got wicked hearts? That is the opposite of His message to us. It makes Him sick. It is not the gospel. It is not the truth. And we need to be careful that we believe what our daddy has really said about us. How much more will your Father in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Again, a direct appeal to Jews who are still under the law, and here He is. Enter through the narrow gate. They're like, what? Where is this gate? I am the gate, he would say. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. What's the narrow gate? What's the message that is attacked most? Is a message of morality and ethics attacked in this world, turn on any news network and they will praise people who have expressed morality and ethics of a good kind. The most popular message on the planet is be good, be nice, change your vocabulary so that you seem loving. Tweak your words, tweak your verbiage, tweak what you say, tweak how you act in the workplace so that we can all have some peace and calm and politeness and some semblance of love. Morality and ethics is touted all over the planet as being the way, the gate. That's why it's a wide gate. World religions are filled with systems of morality and ethics. There's a book and a founder and a way called Act Good. And if you act good, then God will bless you. And if you act poorly and don't obey the rules, God may just curse you. If it's not that bad, we'll massage it a little bit, make it more palatable, and draw in the masses with a looser flavor of the same. But world religions are based on principles and rules. Christianity is based on letting Christ rule. Big difference. The free gift of salvation is the narrow gate. Oh, that's easy believism. That's greasy grace. That's hyper grace. I'm hyper about it. It's pretty exciting. And I use the grease for my hair. (laughs) But do you see what we're doing? We're throwing stones at the grace of God because it sounds so easy. If it's so easy, why are there so few that enter? Pride gets in the way. The arrogance of self-improvement and human achievement. Those are the obstacles. That's what makes this gate so narrow. He goes on. You see him warning. He's warning about people they haven't even met yet. (laughs) Beware, it's coming. False teachers everywhere. False prophets. False teachers. Make sure you hear the truth. Don't be led astray. Don't be distracted. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They may not look bad, I had to. (laughs) 
But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad trees bear bad fruit. Now, didn't he just call them evil? So which, which tree are they? Currently, they are a bad tree, and they need to know it. He called them evil. They're a bad tree. They need to be uprooted, taken out of Adam, taken out of earthiness and evil and ugliness and wickedness, uprooted and transplanted. Just like we had trees put in yesterday all over this property, they came from somewhere else. They were uprooted, grown somewhere else, uprooted and transferred onto our property so that they might bear fruit here in a new location. Do you see that we've been uprooted? We've been transplanted. We've been rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. What makes a tree good is where it's rooted. It's not the tree itself. There's nothing about our flesh and bones that makes us righteous. It's about where we're rooted. If you're rooted in Jesus Christ, then you are as righteous as Jesus Christ. You are a good tree. And so he makes this distinction because they are about to be wildly distracted. They're about to be manipulated and coerced into trading the true gospel for something else. And we see that all through the New Testament. Jesus is the first one to warn about false prophets. We might have thought it was Paul or Peter or James or John. Jesus is the first warning. He is warning that this other message will come in and try to ruin it. And a little leaven, just a little bit of yeast, a little bit of leaven ruins the whole thing. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That is not nice. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Oh, Jesus is a good teacher. He's a sweet teacher of fine principles. Well, here he's talking about fire. Apparently, he's not looking to just make friends. The truth, the truth is what he's about. I come with a sword. And this message, as sad as it is, this message will divide families. It will divide parents from children and husbands from wives. People will argue and bicker and divide and divorce and leave each other over this. This is a big deal. This is war. This is a spiritual war of ideas. And it's huge. And so what he is saying here is that you're a good tree and you bear good fruit. You say, I, I can still sin. Yeah, that's not fruit. But who is the only one on the planet who can bear good fruit? A believer. An unbeliever, their righteousness is like filthy rags. They, it looks like they've got fruit. They've given millions of dollars and they're in Adam. The fruit is wax fruit. It's fake. They've been so sweet and so nice and so loving. And there is a natural love from parent to child. And God uses that. And we have families and we have, we have camaraderie in a community. And that's great. The Holy Spirit is at work on the earth. But still, if you're in Adam, you're in Adam. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. And so there's only two kinds of people on the planet. Those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ. There are nice people in Adam. Philanthropic people in Adam. Sweet people in Adam. They have learned to project a sweetness and a kindness. And they have learned that it is better to be nice than to not. It's true. It's better to be nice than to not. But you know what is best of all? What is best of all is to open the door of your life and to be inhabited by the resurrection life of Jesus. Now that's really nice. 
And so you'll know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So we've got all kinds of strategies that people use. They use, as we'll see in a minute, religious works. They try to bear false fruit. Let me tell you, there's lots of fruits out there. (laughs) Lots of fruits trying to bear fruit. But there's one way. It's a narrow gate. It's a door. It's a way that is so straightforward and so simple that people will miss it. He who does the will of my Father. Let me see. I'll get out my my legal pad and I'll start taking notes. Jesus, show me the will of the Father. Show me the works of the Father so that I may do them. You know, I'm not the first person to ask that question. They asked Jesus this 2,000 years ago. They pulled out their legal pad, perhaps. They were ready to take notes. Show us the works of the Father so that we may do them. Ready and begin. Number one, and they expected the Ten Commandments. I don't know. They expected the greatest commandments, the two greatest in the law. They expected a laundry list of self-improvement. Who knows what they expected, but they were ready to take notes and go out and do. And you know what Jesus said? The work. He changed their grammar, not works, work. The work of the Father is that you believe in the one whom he sent. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but give us something to do. Give us a do-do gospel. That's what we want. Do, do, do. And what Jesus would ultimately give them was a gospel of done, done, done. Will you believe it? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, look at what we did for you. That's this whole passage in summary. Did we not prophesy? You saw my hand on their head, Lord. You saw me. I was talking funny. Look how I spoke in tongues. And he would say, look how I spoke in love. You prophes- we prophesied in your name. In your name we cast out demons. We were doing exorcisms on Thursdays. Every Thursday, Lord. In your name we performed many miracles. And then I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I I mean, is this a bunch of Christians who lost their salvation? Number one, why are they calling him Lord? Not because they're saved. It's because every knee will bow. There's a day, this day, when every human on the planet who has ever lived will recognize the Lord God, whether they like it or not. Second, look at these people's theology. Look at what they're bragging about. Are they bragging on the cross and the resurrection? Are they saying, Lord, I knocked, you knocked on the door, I let you in. I am saved forever because of your work, because of the cross and the resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Is that their attitude? (laughs) Far from it. Their attitude is the polar opposite. God, look at me. Look at what I did for you. I even tacked on in Jesus' name at the end of stuff. And so they're bragging on themselves instead of bragging on Jesus. They're bragging on their works instead of on the finished work. They've got a do-do gospel instead of a done, done gospel. The cross, it's done. The resurrection, it's done. By this time, they should be bragging on Jesus. Paul said, may I never boast except in the cross of Jesus Christ. There's room for bragging. Let's brag on Him. Therefore, everyone, uh, let me say one more thing. Depart from me. I never knew you. Right? 
Not, I knew you for a while. Eh, you were doing okay. And then that one thing happened, and I left you. No, 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 no. That's not what it says. I never knew you. These are not believers losing their salvation. These are people who never knew the Lord, and the Lord never knew them. Do you know that we are known? Paul says that, that we are known by God, or rather known by Him, he says. We are fully known by Jesus Christ. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Don't worry, we're not going to sing. Uh, the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it did not fall for it, it had been founded on the rock. And guess what, Catholics? That rock is not Peter. Jesus pointing to himself would have said, and on this rock I will build my kingdom. Peter, your name means stone, but on this rock I will build my kingdom. And so he's teaching about the foundation, and the foundation is himself. As we learn later, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Not Peter, not some other thing, not some parallel message, not some papal authority that is equated with Scripture, but Jesus is the cornerstone. Build your house on Him. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and actually great was its fall. It was a catastrophe built on stuff they had done and demolished in the end, crumbling in the sight of the Lord. What is your house built on? Is it built on popsicle sticks that you have put together through your works, your good deeds, your false fruit from the past? Or is your house built on the rock, Jesus Christ Himself, Savior, Lord, and life? You know what their reaction was? We finish with this because Jesus finished with this. When he had finished, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because it wasn't drivel, because it wasn't garbage, because it wasn't a bunch of morality and ethics nonsense. He was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Well, what have we seen? Jesus is not boring. He presents the true standard of the law so that He can show us our need to open the door, to accept an invitation, and to enjoy a a new way called grace. Conclusion, the two messages of Jesus. One sermon, two messages. If you conflate those two, you will read the Sermon on the Mount and be confused For the rest of your days. Do you see the two messages of Jesus talking to the Jews who are full of themselves, full of pride, full of self-improvement, full of human achievement, and showing them you want that way? Well, here is the standard. Good luck with that. And then turning to them once again at the very end of this sermon and saying, there's a way. Seek. Seek and you'll find it. I'll stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, you will be shocked at my grace. A new way of grace ushered in through the cross and the resurrection. A new way of grace. That is what we enjoy today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the powerful words of Jesus. We agree that in them we die. We agree that in them The coffin is nailed shut. We agree that in them we cannot fix ourselves, improve ourselves, get better at it, try our best, because the law will not grade on a curve. We confess it. Apart from you, we can do nothing. 
Father, we see it. We see what you've done in your brilliance. We see what you've done. You've led us to the cross. You've led us to the tomb. You've led us to a place of resurrection in you. Father, we embrace all that Jesus Christ is to us. He is our life. He is our way. He is our gate. He is our everything. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.